Interestingly enough, uh, Alex originally said he was particularly interested in the older age group and some of the things that are being talked about a lot at the moment about things like dementia and the way in which the brain declines towards the end of one's life. Uh, and, you know, that's fair enough, and I'll certainly be addressing some of that. But I said, actually, if that's all you look at, you're missing out on a lot of the most interesting things that actually happen with the brain right from the time when the, the child is actually conceived. And so I suggested to him that maybe rather than just looking at the end of life, which might be a bit depressing for some people, especially me, because I'm certainly in the over 70 age group, so uh, I, I, I have to think about that. So I said, you know, maybe we should actually look at what's happening right through the brain's life and understand a bit more about what a fascinating organ it actually is. So that's really what I'm going to do tonight, starting off by saying, say hello to your brain. We all have seen pictures like this and we all have an idea that inside our head there's something that looks a bit like this. And it doesn't actually look all that fantastic in many ways. A big lump of flesh, a big lump of nerves, they're all sitting there in the head. I think, hmm, it doesn't look quite as wonderful as people make it out to be. But in fact, it's extremely important, obviously, in everything that we do. And in fact, if we look at some of the basic brain statistics, that the brain takes up about 2% of your body weight. So it weighs on average somewhere between 1.3 and 1.4 kilos. But in spite of the fact that it's only that small proportion of your body's actual weight, it takes up something like 20% of your body's energy. Uh, and that's quite interesting because it tells you something about how active your brain actually is and the fact that it's working away all the time. One of the things that people often don't realize, for example, is that your brain continues to work hard when you're asleep. In fact, in some, time, in some cases, it actually works harder while you're asleep. So it's churning away there, using up an awful lot of your body's energy all the time. And that means there's a very high cost to you in terms of having this, this very active brain. There's a psychologist called Bruce Hood that I heard give a talk many years ago called The Domesticated Brain. And he was pointing out that, in fact, there's lots of things that assumptions that we make about the way in which the brain has developed through history and through evolution, which are not actually correct. Uh, and he was saying that when actually we become more domesticated, our brains get smaller. And if we look at the history of brain evolution, we see some of that, that in the early days, the very oldest hominid species, Homo habilis, and then going on to Homo erectus and eventually the Neanderthals, we could see what most people expect was going to happen, that the brain got bigger. <coughs> then we look at the human species about 60,000 years ago, which is the start of the most modern branch of mankind, and we see that the brain was slightly smaller than it was in the Neanderthals. And when we look at modern man, we see that the brain is smaller still. In fact, it's about 10 to 15% smaller than it was 60,000 years ago. And that tells us something about the brain generally. As I say, it's a very high energy consuming part of the body. It has to be very efficient in order to not overuse our energy in many ways. And so the brain all through this evolution has not only been growing bigger to have more functions, but then has been refining that to try to make sure that it's only doing the things that are really useful or necessary. And the reason that, that Bruce Hood talked about it as the domesticated brain was that we see this in animals too, that when they become part of large groups, they're no longer as dependent on having all the skills themselves because they can rely to some extent on the fact that they've got group support and they exchange skills within the group and the brain takes account of that and says, well, maybe we don't need to work quite so hard in some of these areas. So that's quite interesting just in terms of what we understand about the brain generally. It's not simply a case of the brain getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. It's actually a case of the brain getting more and more refined all the time. And that's actually quite an interesting difference. But nonetheless, it is a very complex structure, and you've probably all seen diagrams like this in the past, showing that the brain has many different areas that tend to specialize in particular kinds of functions within the brain. And it's extremely complex, and we actually still, even after all this time, 
have a relatively poor understanding of a lot of the ways in which the brain works. Although we know something about the neurology and we know something about the specialization of areas and we know something about what happens with things like damage to the brain, there's a lot we don't know. And one of the most fundamental things that we don't know is how we know that we are we. Consciousness. How do we have this sense of self-awareness that comes out of this lump of stuff stuck in our heads? Uh, and there's still a lot of interesting research going on about that, trying to understand how you take the neurology of something like this and turn it into things like self-awareness. And there was an interesting event earlier on this year that there was a philosopher and a neurologist had set a bet 25 years ago that by now we would completely understand consciousness. Well, the philosopher won the bet because he said, no, we're not going to understand it. Uh, and the neurologist had to admit, no, we're not there yet. Even after all that study, we still don't really understand some of these things. Anyway, I'm not a neurologist. I'm a psychologist by training. So I'm not going to go into all the neurology. You'll be pleased to hear because that would get exceptionally complex. I'm going to be looking at it from a rather different perspective, which is not your brain through the ages in terms of evolution, but the brain through your ages in terms of what actually happens with the brain from the time of conception right through to later life. Because it's quite a fascinating story, and I don't think many people fully understand the story. So I'm going to be using this kind of timeline and looking at gestation or pregnancy, looking at childhood, looking at adolescence, looking at adulthood, adulthood and old age, and looking at some of the things that are important in terms of actually maintaining brain health. Well, let's start off with conception and gestation while the, the uh, child or what's going to be the child is in the womb. And from the embryonic stage, which is about four to five weeks after conception has actually taken place, absolute miracles start to happen. But vast numbers of cells are produced in the, the embryo, many of which are going to be brain cells, and they are churned out at a huge rate, and they begin to group, uh, group together in different areas according to the function that they're eventually going to have. So there's all this going on, the cells aggregate into distinct regions, and altogether there's something like 200 trillion cells are produced during this phase, during the, the uh, conception and pregnancy phase. Uh, now, in actual fact, some of these cells will eventually die off because, as I say, the brain is trying to also be efficient. So it trims out all these cells initially, but it will eventually trim them down to something like 100 trillion cells. That's still a pretty large number going on there in your head. But imagine you know, that during this very early stage of pregnancy, this is a major exercise that's going on, developing what's going to be the brain that's going to control the child or control the adult throughout their lives. During the fetal stage, the uh, cortex of the brain begins to build up. It begins to develop a structure. And there are different layers of that structure. There's six different layers, starting from the very primitive brain, which controls the most basic functions within the brain. But there are other layers building up uh, including the sort of cortex at the, the very top of the brain that's the wrinkled bit. And by the eighth week of pregnancy, we're already seeing that the, the child is forming and that some of the important neural pathways are forming. So from 12 to 14 weeks, the embryo is producing these cells and producing some of these connections at the rate of something like 15 million an hour. And that, that sounds quite extraordinary, but it's producing this massive change in terms of the cells and the way in which the cells are grouping and beginning to connect. And in fact, in this uh, photograph here, or this uh, x-ray here, you can actually see that some of the things are beginning to develop, like the beginning of an eye there, for example, or the beginning of an ear there, even at that early stage. And that shows that a lot of the neural connections are already pretty well developed by that stage in terms of actually producing what's eventually going to be the child. So we begin to see the eye and the ear 
developing there. So just thinking about what's actually happening during pregnancy, there's an enormous set of changes going on, an enormous set of production in terms of the, the neural capacity of the, the, the child that's going to be the brain that controls them. Well, let's move on from, from the, the, the womb to looking at what happens once the child is actually born. And one of the things about babies' brains right from the time when they're actually born is that they soak up everything that's happening around about them. They become totally aware of all the things that are going on in their environment. Now, they may not actually understand these because they don't have that self-awareness developed yet or certainly don't have it fully developed yet. But nonetheless, they're taking in all that information and they are reacting to the things that are going on in their environment. And all these things, again, are helping the brain to actually develop. Uh, and one of the things that, that uh, we had a talk on earlier on this year was Antonella Saras, who was a linguistic, who was talking about, a linguistic professor, who was talking about uh, learning languages and being bilingual and multilingual. And one of the points that she made was that many people assume that it's going to confuse children if you actually try and teach them more than one language at a time. And in fact, quite the reverse turns out to be true. The child's brain is so good at attending to these kinds of things, even though it doesn't actually understand language fully at this point, it's beginning to detect sounds, it's beginning to recognize that there are characteristics to this. And in fact, the more languages it learns, the better it learns them, because it learns something about language, not just a language, but about language in the more general sense. And it can make sense of that without any great difficulty. And this is something that's particularly of interest to myself and my wife is sitting in the front here at the moment, because uh, this year we became grandparents for the first time. Uh, and our granddaughter is now three months old. She actually is living in Hong Kong, and my wife's just about to go out to Hong Kong to see her and looking forward to that very much. But what we are seeing is that we, of course, from the family, get all the videos every day and all the photographs every day that are showing us how our granddaughter's developing. And you can see some of these things actually happening. You can see in the videos this young child, three months old, yesterday was it, or the day before yesterday, three months old, is already beginning to differentiate and relax and react in terms of the various things that are happening around them at that point. So babies are learning any language, although eventually they will tend to concentrate obviously on what they hear most. So they'll eventually end up focusing on one particular language. But at that stage, they're actually open to pretty well anything. And in fact, the more variety that they get, the better. Because my uh, stepson and my granddaughter are actually from Chinese origin, they also speak Chinese, but they're very definitely teaching her both Chinese and English, or speaking to her in both Chinese and English. And that's true of some of the other young children that we know of in China as well. But at any rate, all this is having an enormous impact on the way in which the brain is developing. And so it's developing something like one million new connections every second. That's pretty hard work. <laughs> uh, and it's certainly the time when the brain is probably more active than it's ever going to be at any other time in life. The rate of development during this early infancy stage is absolutely amazing. So starting from about 18 months to two years, the, the uh, child begins to move on from the very basic, just sort of instinctive reactions and picking up information to beginning to be able to use that information to formulate that in different ways. And what this chart shows is that during the first year of the, the child's life, there are various things that peak. So the first one here is the first thing that's developing in the child is its ability to react to the senses, to sight, hearing, smell, all these kinds of things. And that's developing at a huge rate right in the very early months, in the first two or three months. So that's where our granddaughter probably is right about now. But then, as I've just been talking about language, even as early as about seven or eight months, the child is beginning to peak in terms of its ability to actually respond to language, to begin to form some kind of ideas about what the structure of language might be. 
and that's peaking around this period uh, at the end of, of, of that for seven or eight months. But you know, once you get on to the, the year and into the two-year period, what's beginning to develop at that point is much more higher cognitive function. So the child is beginning to think, if you like, beginning to have the beginnings of self-awareness, beginning to be able to, to reason about things to some extent. But the other key thing about this is that, that this is all happening in the first year to two years. And that that's a very crucial period. That that's extremely important that that's able to happen for the child at that stage. As I say, more active during that period than probably the brain is going to be at any other period in its life. And I mentioned that the, the uh, child initially produces something like 200 trillion neurons, and that gets trimmed down. And the way in which it actually gets trimmed down is what's known as synaptic pruning. And it's a very simple concept. It's use it or lose it. But the things that turn out to be useful and effective for the child, the connections in the brain that turn out to do something worthwhile or to convey useful information, these are strengthened. But on the other hand, the ones that don't seem to be doing very much or aren't very useful or don't seem to be relevant begin to die off. And equally, the ones that are there there's connections developing between the neurons that survive. And the thing again that decides that is, are these connections doing something useful? So if there is a useful connection, then the neurons wire together and you get nerve pathways occurring between these different neurons. But on the other hand, if it's not actually useful, then these neuron connections don't tend to appear in the same way. So we say those that fire together uh, wire together. So if neurons are being triggered by the same sorts of things and being effective in the same sorts of situations, then there will be tending to be connections developed between these neurons. And it's that growth of the connections that actually is the big thing for, for the child at this stage, that by the time they're down to something like 100 trillion neurons, they're probably going to have almost as many neurons as they will ever have, but the big development at that point is not that they develop more neurons, but they develop more and more connections. Uh, and that this is where the, the uh, growth of the brain and the development of the brain is really occurring. So the thickness of the cerebral cortex, the outer part of the brain, that is pretty well developed by about the age of two. And that's the area that's involved in the things that are most important to the kid at that stage, the things that we've just been talking about, things like the ability to perceive senses, sensory perception, the ability to begin to think about developing language, and the sort of consciousness, the ability to recognize something about being able to think for yourself. But it keeps growing to about 80% of adult size by age three. So that's quite early. People assume that children are actually uh, not developing a full brain size till much later, but actually about 80% of the brain size is there by age three. And indeed, 90% of the brain size is pretty well there by the age of five. But the gray matter volume, and that's the, the, the volume that's creating a lot of the, the neurons that are actually going to be important in the overall brain structure, that peaks around about the age of seven. So all these things are happening pretty early in the child's development, and yet that's going to determine how that brain works for the rest of their lives. And that's where the bottom comment comes in, because the things that happen to the child in that crucial period you could actually go back as far as you know the pregnancy and say that obviously damage can be done to the brain in pregnancy too. But during that early childhood period, particularly up to about the age of seven, positive experiences for the child that encourage these developments, encourage these neuronal developments, encourage these links to be developing between neurons, they're absolutely crucial in that period. And if the child has good experiences at that point, and these things are being produced in a productive way, that tends to be a, a good outcome that stays with them throughout their lives. And we see that much later on in terms of things like their success at school or their general success in life. They tend to be healthier and more successful in school and life. 
But unfortunately, the reverse is also true, and that's where issues like child abuse become really very important. Because it's not just in a sense that the child suffers immediate abuse, that's bad enough, but it's actually damaging the brain structure as well. And that means that that's going to have a long-term effect, a long-term negative effect. So looking at how we look after children during this early period, as I say, in the two, roughly two to roughly ten, and in fact, one of the things is that in a lot of the slides you'll see that I, I use an approximate because there's no such thing as something that's going to be true for absolutely everybody. We're talking about averages here, and what I'm going to try and do is to, to hit the highlights rather than assume that I can explain absolutely everything about what's going to happen with, with a particular child or any particular individual. So we're saying that this childhood period enormous development going on, the brain is developing in enormous ways, particularly affected by things like the sensory experiences, things like language, and the beginning of being able to make sense of the world in some constructive way. One of the interesting things is that uh, this is a graph showing how easy it is to learn at different points in your life. And what you see here is that if you're in the early age group, particularly when we're talking about up to 10 here, learning is actually extremely easy given the opportunity. Child, a child just soaks up information, soaks up new knowledge with very, very little effort. But as you go through life, that ability to actually pick up new information, to learn new things, begins to drop off quite sharply. And so by the age of 30, it's already becoming more difficult. Now, it doesn't mean that beyond that age people can't learn anything, but what it does mean is that the effort required is a lot greater. So again, we're seeing that this childhood period here is an absolutely critical time. It's so easy to teach children things that are positive and appropriate during this time, and we must use that time to the best effect, because the longer you wait, the harder it gets. Anyway, let's move on to adolescence. And again, I'm using some approximations here, approximately 10 to, and you know that it says 19 stroke 25. Now, the reason for that is that people talk about teenagers as being the appropriate uh, description for this, this adolescent phase, and they assume that that's literally true, that we're talking about the teens, the 10 to 19. Uh, and certainly a lot of the development does happen during that time. But one of the things that's interesting is that there's lots of evidence that suggests that adolescence goes on rather longer than that. Uh, and that, in fact, the brain is still developing in major ways, at least up until about the age of 25, and to some extent, perhaps even longer. But if you're looking at the kinds of things that are true of the adolescent period, it's not enough just to look to 19. You really have to be considering the fact it goes on beyond that, and that's quite important, as we'll see later on. Lon Steinberg is a psychologist who's famous for his research, particularly on the adolescent period. And he came up with this saying, a teenager's brain has a well-developed accelerator, but only a partly developed brake. And that's quite an insightful way of thinking about the way in which the brain is developing at this particular time. But one of the things that's driving a lot of the reactions in the adolescent is a particular area of the brain called the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is a fairly primitive area of the brain, but it, it, spe it works more specifically in the, the kind of instinctive reaction area. It produces reactions that don't require a great deal of thought. And one of the characteristics of this is the fight or flight response that you know, if, if you're uh, walking across the road and a bus comes at you, you don't necessarily stop and think, oh, look, a bus, I wonder what tie the driver's wearing. Your amygdala says, get out of there, and it reacts very quickly, and you have an instinctive reaction. Well, there's lots of instinctive reactions like that that are going on. And in the, the adolescent brain, the effect of the amygdala is quite strong. And what that means is that many of the reactions and many of the actions that the teenager or the adolescent is carrying out are not necessarily very well thought through actions. They're much more instinctive reactions. They're a gut reaction to whatever is happening at the time. 
And one of the other things that feeds into that is that the teenage brain is particularly sensitive to the hormone dopamine. And dopamine is known as the feel-good hormone. It's one of the things that makes you feel better. If you get a rush of dopamine, you feel pretty good. And so anything that produces that rush of dopamine for a teenager, the instinctive reaction is, well, what more of that, please? And they then fall into that pattern of behavior without having thought, is this actually doing me any good? Is this actually something I should be doing? It's, oh, this feels good. Dopamine reaction, instinctive reaction to that from the amygdala is, let's do more of that. Uh, and of course, that's where we find that there are some problems often in the, the adolescent brain because they talk about it as being filter deficient. There's, there's nothing in there saying, hang on a minute, think this through. Is that actually the best thing you could be doing in this situation? Is this the appropriate way to react? So the filter is not working that well. And that's what Lawrence Steinberg meant by saying the break is not that well developed. There's nothing sort of slowing you down and saying, hang on a minute. Maybe we should be thinking about this a bit more dif uh, differently. And one of the consequences of that is that during the adolescent period, adolescents tend to be much more risk prone because they're not thinking about the consequences or the potential consequences of the actions that they're actually undertaking. So they're much like more likely to just jump into doing something because it seemed like a good idea at the time, rather than because they've thought it through and thought what the consequences might be. And also their sensation seeking because the sensations produce more dopamine. And that means that, you know, this is, feels really good, so keep doing more of that. Something that's a bit risky, something that's a bit sensation seeking sounds like a good idea. And they're also very susceptible to peer pressure. So they look around and see what all their mates are doing and think, I should be doing the same as that. They all seem to be having a good time. So I should do all these things too. And again, without thinking about whether their mates are actually behaving appropriately, whether, again, there are potential negative consequences to their actions. And the other thing is, because the brain is still undergoing a lot of development at this time, it's actually very vulnerable to damage. Uh, and if you look at what a lot of teenagers and adolescents are doing, often they're engaging in things that are likely to damage the brain development. Alcohol is one of the big ones, but things like a lot of the drugs, etc., that they might be exposed to at that stage are also things that might seriously actually damage their brain. And again, it's not just that it damages the brain at that point in time. If that damage is done, it's going to carry through into the rest of their lives. So... All this going on, very vulnerable, very reactive, not thinking very clearly about things, just going for something because it feels good at the time. That's very typical of the, the adolescent. As I say, the brain is still developing at this stage. There's still a lot of pruning going on. A lot of these 200 trillion cells that are being reduced down to 100 trillion, some of that trimming is still going on. There's also the, the decisions about which connections between these neurons are going to be effective and useful and some trimming going on there. Uh, and it's happening in different parts of the brain at different rates. So we're saying that this teenage brain, the adolescent brain, is by no means finished developing. And there's still a lot of room for things to be changing either positively or negatively during that period. It's about 80% functionally developed. So on the whole, the brain is doing most of the things that it will always need to do. But interestingly, the area of the brain that's least developed is the frontal area of the brain. And the frontal area of the brain is the one that tends to control more thoughtful decision-making processes, weighing up things, making uh, decisions about what's good or bad, developing a sense of personality, a sense of direction, a sense of self. These that area of the brain is not actually as well developed as the rest of the 80%. And so again, that makes them more vulnerable to many of the negative effects that might occur during adolescence. So it takes them longer, for example, and we find it more difficult to weigh up actions, to think, should I do this? Should I do that? How do I make these kinds of choices? to judge different situations and understand what's going on in that situation that may help them to decide 
how to react or deal with that situation, harder to make decisions. Uh, and so again, we see that in, in a lot of adolescent behavior, and I'm sure most of you will have observed that, both in yourselves, perhaps when you were adolescents. I mean, I think back on my adolescent days, and I think I did some pretty stupid things at times. <laughs> And I'm sure that's probably true for a lot of you too. And certainly if you have children who've gone through that stage and watched them reacting in these kinds of ways, you think, what on earth do they think they're doing? <laughs> but it's explicable in terms of understanding what's actually happening with the brain. Now, there are some good things because we talked about this difference between the ease in learning and the effort you have to make to learn. They're still at this stage during these, these years and the uh, tens to, to 25s when in fact it's still relatively easy to learn things and they don't have to make huge efforts to do so. So they tend to learn faster and remember things longer. But one of the questions is what do they then do with that capacity? Uh, and because this frontal brain is less well developed, what you find is that they are inefficient in terms of things like paying attention to things. They te their mind tends to flip easily from one thing to another. They're not that good at things like self-discipline uh, and they don't always finish what they started. They're not necessarily good at task completion. So again, a very important time that we see developing there in terms of the teenage brain and what the impact of that is both on their behavior at that stage and on how they might develop in the future. One of the things that's developing and the brain is taking account of at this stage is socialization and the development of social skills. So the adolescent is not only developing a sense of who I think I am, but they're also saying, and who do they think I am? What do other people think of me? What are they making of me? How are they reacting to me? Am I getting a good reaction from people or a bad reaction from people? Am I fitting into the crowd or not fitting into the crowd? And that becomes very important at this stage. And in general, there's what's often referred to as appearance attractiveness. And that is if something looks good, it must be good. <laughs> uh, and this is the assumption not only for what they see around about them, but also looking at the behavior that they see in other people. If, if they seem to be having a good time, it must be the right thing to do. If they seem to be uh, attractive people that are being successful, I should be like them. Uh, and one of the things that's get talked about a lot nowadays is the effect of social media in this area, the false images that are actually put up to people about what they should be like. You know, this person seems wonderful. They're wearing wonderful makeup. They have great clothes. They seem to be having a wonderful time. Wow, that's really good. I must be like that too. Without actually thinking, is that true? Uh, is it relevant? You know, what did they have to do to get that in the first place? And there's an interesting trend that's been occurring recently in social media of some of the influencers actually taking the makeup off, taking the fancy clothes off and saying, well, actually, when it comes down to it, this is me, not what you see in the influence on TikTok or whatever it happens to be. But it's very powerful for this adolescent group. If they see these images and it looks good, must be good. But they're also learning how to, to actually interact with people. They're learning about things like social communication and understanding. They're learning about how to interpret other people's behavior, other people's reactions to things. And this is all good development because that's going to help them to work in a social environment. But I mentioned risk-taking earlier on. And in fact, they're very different in terms of the ways in which they take risks from either children who tend to be quite conservative and cautious on the whole, uh, in the early days, and adults who tend to also be more conservative and cautious because by the time you get to adulthood, they're thinking more about what the potential consequences of things are. But because of what we were saying earlier about the lack of development in the adolescent brain at this stage, what we see is that they are much more inclined to react instinctively. But not only that, it turns out they're much more likely to do that when they're with a group of peers, a group of friends, a group of mates. So if they're in a crowd, they'll tend to always do what the crowd does because that's what seems good. That's the attractive thing. That's the thing that seems to produce the, the good reaction. And that's quite different from adults. We don't see that same effect in adults, that being in a crowd in adults, 
has fewer effects, it doesn't have no effect, but it has fewer effects on the decision choices that people might make. For the young person, if they're with friends, then what friends are doing will very largely govern what they will decide to do too. Uh, and that makes them quite vulnerable in some ways, particularly if they're with a group who have been a bit odd or a bit silly uh, or doing things that are actually potentially going to be harmful. The other area that's useful to look at is the emotions that occur during the, this teenage period. One of the interesting things is that it's one of the periods in life when actually uh, teenagers tend to need more sleep than the average adult. The average adult will generally need about seven to eight hours. But the average teenager or adolescent will need something like nine to ten hours sleep a night. And that's quite interesting because society's not set up that way. Their tendency is to want to go to bed late and sleep late. But they've got to go to school in the morning. And school starts at nine o'clock, so you're up at half past seven or eight o'clock and you're ready and you're off to school. And it's been said that a lot of school kids, uh, especially in the mornings at school, are actually sleep deprived because that's not the way in which their natural biology wants them to behave. It's not the natural way in which their brain wants them to behave and that they end up being sleep deprived. And you look at some of the problems that are talked about in education of people saying, you know, kids won't pay attention in the morning, kids don't seem to be really with it, they're not really there. Well, perhaps it's because actually they're suffering a degree of sleep deprivation. And odd ideas come out from time to time, like maybe school should start at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and in some respects, if you're looking at what's going on with teenage brains, that would actually make sense. But society as a whole is not set up to deal with that. And so we continue to, to get the, the, the young person to go to school when perhaps actually they're not really awake, not really with it, and are suffering a degree of sleep deprivation as a result. Another thing in terms of emotions is that, you know, we all experience emotions and we can all describe the strength of the emotion that we're feeling. And to some extent, that will depend on what's actually causing that particular emotion. But one of the interesting things, again, for teenagers is that when they experience an emotion, they tend to experience it much more strongly than an adult would given the same initial stimulus. So they tend to, start to, to have this emotion maybe two to four times as strong as an adult would in any situation. So the things that are happening to them have a much bigger emotional impact than they might do in terms of an adult. And there's an even worse catch in relation to that, and that is there's a thing called the THP hormone, which in stressful situations is actually released into the brain. And if you're an adult, the THP hormone actually has a calming and relaxing effect. It helps adults to deal with crises because it actually makes them slow down a bit, makes them feel a little bit more react uh, less reactive, a little bit more calm. The fascinating thing is in teenagers, THP hormone has exactly the opposite effect. It actually makes them feel worse. It actually makes them feel more anxious, more afraid in these situations. And so, although the brain is doing something which in an adult would actually help the adult to cope, in the adolescent, the brain is doing something that's actually making it worse for the adult and making it harder for them to cope. Uh, and what's more, if you're an adult, you say, oh, calm down, calm down. For the teenager that's got this THP hormone firing off and producing all, it's not going to listen to that, <laughs> not going to hear that. It doesn't make any sense, this idea of cal cal how can I calm down? Because, in fact, this hormone is busy saying exactly the opposite. And one of the other interesting things, of course, is that, that uh, as this is all developing in, in the young person and they're beginning to see life differently and they're aware that they're experiencing things to some extent differently from the adult, differently from their parent perhaps, differently from the advice that their parent is giving them, is that they're more likely to become confrontational with adults. So from about the age of 13 and a half or so onwards, children start to really argue with adults, they argue with their parents. And the, the, the quote I always liked was, you know, when I was 15, my father was an idiot. He obviously knew absolutely nothing. 
by the time I was 25, I was amazed at how much he seemed to have learned in the interval. <laughs> and that's because the perception of what's going on is quite different in the adolescent to the adult. And so the, the, the adolescent is not really entirely understanding what's going on for the adult and can't understand why the adult is advising them or seeing things in a different way. And a lot of people get upset about this. You know, my kid's doing nothing but arguing with me. Well, actually, this is normal development. And people worry about it because they think maybe the kid shouldn't be arguing with me. Maybe the kid shouldn't be a bit of a rebel at times. But actual fact, if you're looking at things like brain development and so on, it actually makes sense. And that this is actually normal development. And okay, it's a difficult time and everybody has to find a way to live with it. But it's not a disaster by any means. I was mentioning the fact that, that uh, this teenage period may be rather longer than you think and that it might actually go on to the age of 25 or potentially longer. One of the things which I came across a few years ago was that this actually has legal consequences. That if a young person is in court uh, being tried for a crime, being found guilty, and they're thinking about what should the sentence be, very sensibly... It's interesting to find that sometimes some of these things can actually be sensible, but very sensibly, the guidance from the court is, if they're actually in the 25 to 30 age group, you may have to bear in mind that the brain might not be fully mature, that they may not have fully foreseen the consequences of the actions that they were undertaking, that they might not be quite as guilty, if you like, as they look because their brain was not actually working with an appropriate set of filters going. It wasn't working on the basis of considered actions. It was working on the basis of impulse and short-term reactions and this sort of dopamine effect and all these kinds of things. So in fact, when courts are setting sentences for people in that age group, they're being told, bear in mind, this person may not be fully adult, even though they're as high as the 25 to 30 age group, you have to bear in mind that maybe you can't have the same expectations about how they should have behaved as you would have with someone who was older and more considered. So it's not just a fanciful thing, all this business of the brain not being fully developed at this stage. It has real consequences. Uh, and this is one of the interesting real consequences. So let's move on to adulthood. And again, that's going to be roughly from the kind of age of 22 through to about the age of 17. And that in itself is interesting because when I was young, anyone who was 60 or over was old. Uh, and that's changed. That by and large now, as indeed this is suggesting, we don't begin to consider that people are getting old until they're about 70. Uh, working in the health service, as I did for years, when I first started working in the health service, elderly wards were for people over 65. But now, actually, most elderly wards are for people over 75. Uh, and in fact, a large proportion of the people who are in beds in hospital are actually in that older age group. So something interesting has happened in terms of the longevity of the brain, in terms of its function, that people now are not being considered to be as old at an earlier age like 60 or 65, as they would have been even 60 or 70 years ago. Anyway, point is that we're thinking here about adulthood as being roughly the period from 22 to roughly the kind of age of 70. And during that period, a lot of the brain functions were relatively stable. A lot of the really, really big changes have happened by that kind of period. They haven't entirely stopped. So, but the peak area for, for the main brain areas is somewhere around about the age of 22 to 25. That's largely the finishing off of the developing of the frontal brain, I was saying, is the bit that's missing in a lot of, of the, the adolescents. It's when they begin to consider things in more depth, be able to think more abstractly, being able to develop some impulse control. They're not so driven by the amygdala reaction. They're able to sort of consider things in more depth. And although this goes on to some extent, even later, possibly into the mid-30s, by and large, the bulk of it will have happened in that uh, 22 to 25 age group. But the interesting thing is that it doesn't just stand still. 
that even as early as that kind of age group, some deterioration begins to set in. The brain has reached its peak. So things like reasoning skills, spatial skills, speed of thought, they may begin to actually drop off a bit as early as the late 20s. So while you've got it, use it. <laughs> you know, it's not necessarily going to stay there in an intact form forever and ever, even though this is a relatively stable period in the adult period. And memory, for example, definitely begins to slip once you get into to the mid-30s. It takes longer to learn new things, and it, uh, it's harder to memorize new things, to, to memorize words or names. People begin to notice that, and they get introduced to people and say, oh, I can't remember what his name was. But you know, this is the, the drop-off. And that was what we saw in the graph earlier on, that this, around 30 is the turning point when it begins to become a greater requirement of effort to actually do things. It doesn't mean you can't do them, but it's certainly a lot harder to do them. And that begins to drop off, as I say, even around about the age of, of, of 30. So during your adult phase, the, this phase 22 to 70, gradually cognitive function is fading over time because brain cells begin to shrink and begin to, to die off in some cases. Some cells get replaced. But most of them don't. So brains actually begin to get smaller as you get older. And that begins to be quite noticeable once you get to the age of 40. You can begin to see that the brain is actually beginning to shrink slightly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I mean, some things are actually uh, difficult to, to do from the 50s onwards. Your reasoning skills, your sharpness in your memory and your verbal fluency begin to decline. So for me at 73, standing here talking to you, I have to think harder about the words that I'm using because you know, I, my brain has become to be less efficient in doing that. But on a positive note, because the brain is more integrated in many ways and because this frontal area has developed more, which is the more uh, filtering uh, area of the brain, you find that some things are actually doing even better. So things like moral decision making, regulating your emotions, interpreting social situations, they, these are things that are actually all improving despite the fact that some areas of the brain are beginning to fall off and be slightly less efficient. So it's not as if you suddenly lose everything at that point. And after the age of 60, it certainly becomes more difficult to learn new things and more difficult to access things that you already know. Now, there's an interesting thing about this because a lot of the tests that are used to look at older people's memory certainly show exactly this effect. Once people are older, beyond about the age of 60, their memory appears to be clearer. They appear to have more difficulty recalling things uh, and they have more difficulty learning new things. But there's a couple of interesting studies. The first one I came across was in 2014. And it was a study in Germany. And what they were saying was, actually, it's not so much that people are forgetting things or don't know things. The reason it's harder to recall is because there's so much in there. And I call it the junk cupboard effect. <laughs> that if you are in a junk cupboard and you throw things into the junk cupboard, initially, if you want to get something out of the junk cupboard, it's not that hard. You go along and there's not that much there, so pour a quick saw through, it's that, got it. You chuck more stuff into the junk cupboard and more stuff into the junk cupboard. It becomes a bit harder to go in there and find what you're looking for. Uh, and this appears to be the case with a lot of older adults. It's not that the stuff is lost. It's not that it's inaccessible. It's not that they can't recall things. It's just that it's a bigger job to actually find it. And you find on a lot of these memory tests that if you actually give the older adult longer to do it, then they actually can do it. But if you're judging them against the younger person who does it quite quickly, then their ability looks poor, it looks bad. But it's not that they've actually lost anything. Uh, it's this, this junk cupboard effect. And in fact, the other uh, study was actually much more recent. It was a replication of that earlier study in, in uh, 2022 which came up with much the same. They talked about it as the clutter effect, that your brain was more cluttered. But at any rate, 
as I say, the brain is beginning to decline little bit by little bit, beginning to shrink. Some of the neurons will die off. Some of the connections will become frayed within the brain. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end of the story because the brain actually has some ways of, of, of helping to deal with this and minimize, minimize the adverse effects. So one of them is redundancy. The brain actually has more neurons and more connections than it absolutely needs to function. And so even though some bits of it may not be functioning quite as well, other bits are able to take over some of that function. So you're not losing things at quite the rate that you might otherwise think in terms of the, simply the physical decline of the brain. That new connections actually do form in the brain, even right into old age. Uh, and the brain compensates therefore for the decrease in the number of cells by increasing the number of connections between them. And that's very useful as well because it actually expands the brain's ability to use some of the information it has because it's sometimes making connections with areas that are not normally as well connected and that enables information to flow better. And it used to be thought that once brain cells die off, that's it. There are no new brain cells created. And we now know that's not actually entirely true. It's certainly there's no mass regeneration of brain cells, but in certain circumstances, the brain does actually produce new brain cells. And we find that particularly after things uh, like brain injury or a stroke, where there's been quite a major bit of damage to the brain. And the brain doesn't just accept that and say, that's it, gone, had it. The brain will actually do some redevelopment and if necessary, create some cells. Now it's not doing it at anything like the rate the kid did, uh, I mean, it's, it's never going to do that again, but it, we, we do get some replacement, so it's not all bad news. And that's particularly true of areas that are involved in memory formation and retrieval and things like physical coordination uh, and smoothing out movements. That These are crucial areas for the brain. So if they get damaged, the brain will often make some attempt at least to, to replace what's been damaged and what's missing. But one of the things we can look at is how do we actually maintain the brain? Okay, we know that age-related changes in the brain are occurring, but that doesn't necessarily mean that our ability to use our brain necessarily gets worse. For some of the reasons I've been talking about, you know, some of the things may be redundant in any case, some of the things may be replaced, some of the things may be new connections. Uh, but we know that on the whole, people don't lose a lot of brain function unless there's something fairly major going on. It's some sort of underlying neurological or vascular disorder, vascular disorder about blood flow. So if blood flow to the brain is being interrupted or changed, that can be quite damaging. But unless you actually get these kinds of damage occurring, on the whole, people continue to cope quite well, despite the fact that we know the brain is actually slightly declining. And the other thing that we know is that there are some things that help to minimize that decline, or in some cases may even reverse some of that decline. So it's not entirely a one-way street. There are ways of actually continuing to try and improve the brain and improve its function, even in these circumstances where we know that some things are beginning to, to die off a bit. And in many ways, some of the things that are actually most helpful are perhaps not that surprising. We know that things like regular physical activity is actually very good for brain development. Uh, and part of the reason for that is it improves things like blood flow, improves a lot of, of, of the hormone flows, etc., that are necessary for the brain. So keeping physically active actually helps to keep the brain active. We know that intellectually stimulating activity is extremely important. Again, it's part of this use it or lose it concept. If you're not actually using your brain, if you're not actually challenging your brain, if you're not actually pushing your brain, it gets a bit lazy. It tends to sit back and, oh, don't bother too much about that. So if you're engaging in intellectually stimulating activity, including coming along to sessions like this, and listening to people like me telling you, Lots of interesting information, I hope it's interesting information. That's all good stimulating activity. Staying socially active, things like relationships, relating to other people, having 
Positive relationships, again, is one of the things that keeps the brain working very actively. Dealing with other people is a very important part of keeping the brain active in these situations. Managing stress is very important. Stress can be quite damaging to the brain, all kinds of different ways. It can be damaging to mental health generally, causing things like depression and so on, but it can be damaging the brain itself, or at least causing some of the brain damage to increase in its, its uh, rate. Eating and drinking healthily, that the food you eat uh, and what you choose to drink, and particularly we're talking about things like drinking excessive alcohol, is certainly very damaging to the brain. As we talked about that in the adolescence, it's, it remains true throughout the brain's life that you can damage the brain uh, in a lot of different ways by excessive alcohol. It kills off areas of the brain that actually change the way in which you see things and experience things. But eating healthily, and one of the things that people have been concerned about again recently, and you've probably seen it in the news, is increasing concern about junk food. Because junk food is not only bad for you physically, in terms of it doesn't supply all the necessary things to your body and it throws in lots of extra junk that's potentially doing harm to your body, it harms the brain as well. It's not just your body that all these things, I mean, the brain and the body are not totally separate in that sense. If something goes wrong with the body, the chances are it's going to have a negative effect on the brain too, because the two are very closely interrelated. Uh, things like avoiding smoking, down through the years, we've become more and more aware of the damage that smoking does in a number of ways in terms of the effect of things like nicotine on the brain. And sleeping well, uh, and that again is one that people tend to underestimate. We talked about it in the adolescence, needing 10 hours. But even as an adult, you, know, you need seven to eight hours, and it needs to be good quality sleep. And if you don't actually get regular good quality sleep, again, the brain tends to suffer. And people often say, well, it's okay, you know, I'm, I'm not getting much sleep, but I'll sleep more at the weekend. I have to say that doesn't actually work very well. If the damage is being done during the period when you're stressed and lacking in sleep, it's not all made up by having an extra couple of hours on a Sunday morning. Uh, it will help to some extent, but it's not going to reverse some of the, the damage that bad sleep is regularly going to cause. So there are these things that we can do that are definitely about maintaining. Now, one of the interesting things is that I've included all this in the adulthood bit. A lot of people start to think about these things when they get into the older adult group and they think, oh, maybe I should be doing something. To some extent, it's a bit late by then. You need to have been doing it much earlier because the damage can be done during this period, 22 to 70. Uh, and if you're not taking care of your brain during, during that period, it's not going to be as successful when you get to the 70 plus and you have to start thinking about, hmm, I'm beginning to notice some changes Maybe I should do something about my brain. Ideally, you'll have been doing it before then, uh, but people don't always think that way. So we come to older age, <coughs> 70 plus, and I'm certainly in that age group, so this is of particular interest to me. There's no period in life when the brain and its functions just hold steady. It's changing all the time. Huge changes in childhood, pretty major changes in adolescence, changes going on throughout adulthood that are perhaps less noticeable, even though it's a relatively stable period. But some of your cognitive functions do definitely become weaker with age. On the other hand, some things may actually improve, and that's quite interesting. And we say that you know, the changes that, that can be affected, your ability to encode new information into memory and to retrieve information, but I've already talked about the, the junk cupboard effect and about the clutter effect, which accounts for a lot of that. Uh, so it's worth remembering that, in fact, it's, it's not necessarily always quite as bad as it might look. And there's good news, and that is that as some of the cells in the brain begin to die off, and as some of the connections weaken, the brain continues to create new connections. And in the older adult, one of the ways in which it does that is to create connections that it didn't create before. So a lot of the early development of connections in areas that are all working together on the same kind of thing, have the same function, have the same use. But as you get older, the brain says, well, 
what happens if we send out some connections here? What happens if we send out some connections there? And you get more connections happening between different areas of the brain, which means that the brain is on the whole seeing a bigger picture. That means it's better at detecting relationships between things, better about seeing connections between things, because there are more connections, because these connections are actually beginning to exist in the brain. Uh, and they say that perhaps that's the beginning of, of, of what's known as wisdom in old age, that people are beginning to see the big picture rather than just all the little things that normally would be concerning them on a day-to-day -day basis. And the phrase that I quite like about this, it says, your brain becomes better at seeing the entire forest, but worse at seeing the individual leaves. So you may become less aware of some of the detail, but you've got a much wider and broader understanding of things, and your brain has a much broader and wider capacity to react to things, even though it has been suffering some losses during that period. I also like the little cartoon there, which says, uh, with age comes wisdom, one out of two ain't bad. You know? So <laughs> there is some good news in that sense, in that all this decline is producing some changes that may be a bit negative, but on the other hand, you can be doing things to help to maintain your brain, to help to stimulate your brain, and there are some kinds of positive change taking place as well. So older adults may be slower to find words for call names, they may have problems with multitasking, they may have mild decreases in the ability to pay attention, but that doesn't mean that everything stops. They can still learn new skills and should because again, we've got this business of stimulating the brain. So learning new skills is important. They can still form new memories, that doesn't stop. They can still improve things like language skills and vocabulary because these go right back to childhood. They're very well ingrained in the brain and the brain continues to use these kinds of things pretty well. And there are some areas where it's been suggested that old people may actually perform slightly better. Uh, and that includes things like inductive reasoning so being able to think abstractly, to relate concepts together, and part of this is because of the frontal brain development, part of it might be because of the increasing connections across the brain that enable you to see the bigger picture. Verbal abilities often continue to increase. All the people seem to have a, a good grasp of language if you should be there for them their entire lives. Their ability for spatial reasoning tends to be better. The one that surprised me, I have to say, and surprised my wife was basic maths. So what? <laughs> but in fact, actually, it turns out to be true that, that if you look at older people, I'm talking about basic maths, we're talking about you know, arithmetic, we're not talking about algebra, fancy stuff, but we're talking about the ability to actually have concepts like number and deal with number. I sometimes wonder if it's because when I went to school, they taught you times tables, you know, but... Be that as it may, there's some evidence that, that older people can be better at using basic maths. Older people tend to be more positive on the whole. They tend to accentuate the positive. They tend to be looking more at what they've got that's still good rather than looking at all the bad things. Particularly in younger age groups, very often people can be quite negative. They look at all the problems. They look at all the things that are not going well. They look at all the things that are hard to do. The older person thinks, yeah, but I can still do this, I can still do this. And so they're seeing life more positively in that respect. And that means that they tend to attain a greater sense of contentment. One of the other talks I do is about happiness. One of the things I say in that is actually we shouldn't be trying to be happy because happy is an unsustainable state. It's something that happens in the moment. But we can be content. And that's deciding that we're okay with the way things are. And we can live with that quite happily. And older people tend to be better at doing that. Then we come on to the thing that people tend to worry about most, which is the idea that the brain's going to go totally haywire and they're going to suffer from dementia. Uh, and again, if you read a lot of the news these days, dementia is very high on the news agenda. We know that more and more people are being identified with, with uh, dementia. Part of the reason for that is simply the fact that people are living longer, so the brain deterioration that takes place is more likely to produce dementia within their lifetimes. But uh, if you ask some of the experts you know, what actually causes dementia, well, there's still a lot of debate about some of this, particularly around Alzheimer's. 
that people are not entirely sure what it is that causes Alzheimer's. And because I'm interested in this area, virtually every day I read news articles. There's some new discovery about what's going on with Alzheimer's and some new theory. One of the theories is that a lot of it is genetic. Uh, and that comes down to a thing called the APOE gene. And there are three types of APOE gene, type 2, type 3, and type 4. I don't know why it's not type 1, but there isn't. So types 2, 3, and 4. And what they've decided is that if you have type 4, that's a higher risk of dementia. But on the other hand, if you have type 2, then there's less risk of dementia. And type 3 is the average which actually applies to most of the population and doesn't seem to have any direct relationship to dementia at all. Now, the interesting thing about genes, of course, is that they come in pairs because you inherit one from your father and one from your mother. And so those various combinations can happen in terms of type 2, 3, and 4 in that sense. And the worst situation is reckoned to be if you've got two type 4, then you've got a very high risk of dementia. If you've got two type 2, you've got a low risk of dementia. I went and did some research, uh, offered myself for research with the Glasgow Memory Clinic some years ago, four or five years ago, uh, and they were very interested in how Alzheimer's develops. But they do very thorough checks on you. They do blood checks, they do genetic checks, they do uh, brain screens, brain scans, all the rest of the stuff to try and understand what's going on. So they told me this. They said, you know, type 4 is bad, type 2 is good. Uh, type 3 is not that important one way or the other. So they tested me and they said, you've got one type 4 and one type 2. <laughs> so one is saying you should be more at risk, and the other one's saying you should be less at risk. <laughs> not quite sure what to make of that. <laughs> but at any rate, after all the brain scans and things, they said, actually, you don't seem to have any signs of dementia anyway. Because one of the other things they're looking at for is they called amyloid plaque. And that's a kind of protein, white protein, that builds up around the brain cells. And it's thought to interfere with the way in which the brain functions. Uh, and it's thought that maybe the APOE genes are one of the things that helps to determine whether this plaque develops or not. Uh, and when they did all my brain scans, they said, actually, you don't have any sign of, of uh, amyloid plaque. So we're chucking you off the research. <laughs> I got the boot. But quite happy to get the boot in these circumstances. <laughs> But the risk of getting Alzheimer's is actually quite high. And certainly by the time you get to 85, the risk of getting Alzheimer's is about 50%. Uh, and as I say, part of that is simply because brain changes are going on all the time. And the longer you live, the higher your risk will be. Researchers aren't entirely sure what's going on there. As I say, there's loads of theories about, about uh, Alzheimer's. Some studies show that up to a third of adults may struggle with memory events once they get into this older age group. But on the other hand, what we also find is that something like 20%, a fifth of 70-year-olds, can actually perform as well on cognitive tests as a 20-year-old would. So there's nothing certain about this, that although people worry a lot about dementia, and it is potentially worry, I have to say, that when uh, I went on another health study and they said, what worries you most about your health risk in the future? And my answer was dementia. You know, physical health problems, I could see myself dealing with that if my mind went a bit more doubtful, especially as my mother died of dementia and I watched what happened to her. So it's quite right to be concerned about dementia, but it's not as simple as people assume and it's not an inevitable thing. In fact, there's actually more than one kind of dementia. Alzheimer's is the one that tends to get most attention because it accounts for something like half or three quarters of the dementias that occur. But there are other ones like vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, which all account for fewer of the, the dementia cases. And we can look at that in a little bit more detail. But as I say, dementia is not one specific disease, but a range of things that all have much the same effect in terms of diminishing your brain's capacity to work effectively. So Alzheimer's is the most common one, and I've talked about that in the APOE gene, etc. Vascular dementia is associated with blood flow problems, so it's often uh, discovered around things like heart disease, 
uh, or strokes, anything that changes the blood supply to the brain, because the brain is like any other part of your body, it needs blood flow. And if it's not getting the right blood flow, then things begin to go wrong, things begin to die off. And that's where vascular dementia comes in. Lewy body dementia is a rarer one again, but it's, again, not fully understood, but there are Lewy proteins that seem to attach to neuron cells and diminish the cell's ability to function. And again, that's not fully understood, but it, it certainly produces a reduction in brain function. You've got frontotemporal dementia, uh, which is perhaps one of the ones that, that uh, is quite difficult without being the full story of, of running your brain down entirely because the area that affects the front of the brain, which we've been talking about, as the area that governs things like personality, decision-making, and so on. And people with, with frontotemporal dementia will often show personality change. They'll often become harder to predict. They'll become less clear about their thinking, etc., because of the part of the brain that it's, it's affecting. People can have more than one dementia at the same time. Pretty bad luck if that happens, but it can happen. And there are other rare dementias, and this is not, not going to be an exhaustive list. But there is a word of warning here, and that is that you know, we've been talking about the fact that brain function can fall off for a number of reasons. And sometimes people are thought to be demented when, in fact, there is something going on in the brain that's actually reversible. Uh, and that can be things like medication effects, so the way in which medication is affecting the brain can be slowing the brain down, making it worse, le work less efficiently and effectively. But things like pressure in the brain, so increases in blood pressure, etc., can be damaging the brain in that way, it looks as if it's going to reduce the brain's function. Vitamin deficiency, thyroid, hormone imbalance. So, when people are presenting with potential dementia, it's very important that they're thoroughly assessed. Uh, and it can take up to six months to really look at what's going on with that individual and decide, is this really a dementia or is it something we could actually treat? We could actually do something about it. So jumping immediately to the notion, oh, why well, that must be dementia because it looks like dementia, is not actually a very helpful answer. It needs a lot more careful consideration than that. And my wife, who works with care of the elderly, medicine of the elderly, is particularly aware of some of these cases and reminded me of that. Remind them that, you know, it's not always automatically dementia. <laughs> so there we go. Normal ageing. Well, dementia is not part of normal ageing. And so many adults will actually get through their entire life without ever suffering dementia. It's not inevitable that people are going to get dementia. Normal aging does include some negative changes, so you get physical changes that, that get worse, weakening muscles, weakening bones, stiffening of arteries, etc. And some age-related memory changes I've been saying about the clotter effect and the junk cupboard effect and, and there being some damage to, to the system. But normally speaking, people will retain most of their skills and most of their abilities throughout their life. So that's not to say dementia is not to be worried about at all, but it's, it's perhaps not quite as big a threat as sometimes people think. There's no guarantee that everybody who gets old is going to get dementia. That will not be the case. This is just a list of some of the things that were suggested that you can tell whether it's normal aging or whether perhaps it's something a bit more serious. So you sometimes search for words. Well, that's normal aging. Suddenly realize you can't find your car keys one day. Well, that can happen. Misplace your house keys from time to time. You have trouble deciding which uh, entry to choose in a restaurant. Yeah, all these things may seem like a little bit problematic, but they're signs of, of the normal aging process. On the other hand, if you get to the stage where you, know, you, you can't remember the names of things, so you, you're uh, looking at a table and you call it a stove because your mind's just completely mixed up. It can't actually connect the ideas anymore, uh, particularly in terms of things like driving, for example. Forgetting your car keys is one thing, but forgetting how to drive, that's a whole different ball game. That would certainly be a sign that something much more serious was going on. In terms of, of even uh, things like mood and so on, that everybody can lose their temper sometimes. And if you're older, you may find it a little bit more easy to get upset at times, a little bit more argumentative. 
But if you're screaming at your partner all the time and for no particular reason, that's suggesting something's actually going wrong here. Uh, and maybe that should be looked into in more depth. So this is just an interesting way of saying, okay, some things are normal aging, and we're going to have to recognise that, okay, they do happen, but they're not major disasters and they're not things we should be terribly concerned about. They're quite different from the things that are actually real dementia and much more serious that you have to consider in more depth. The other thing is looking simply at the risk factors that are involved here. So age is one of the major ones, so if you're 65 plus, certainly that makes dementia is more likely. Family history is a big factor, and that will be tied up with some of the genetic theories they have about dementia. So if you have parents or siblings who have dementia, then perhaps you're more at risk. There are interesting racial and ethnic differences that some studies in America particularly showed that older African Americans were twice as likely to get dementia as the white population. Hispanic Americans were one and a half times more likely. So again, this may be tied up with genetics and some of the, the uh, racial or ethnic issues. Poor heart health, so things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking we've mentioned already, they all tend to increase the, the risk of dementia. Uh, and that's because these things are likely to be damaging the brain anyway, and that therefore they're more likely to trigger the onset of dementia. And traumatic brain injury Head injuries can increase the risk of dementia, especially if they're occurring repeatedly. And again, the news about this has been quite interesting because uh, a lot of people have said we should ban boxing. People are getting hit on the head that this ends up causing brain damage. And I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember Muhammad Ali, uh, Cassius Clay, the boxer, who his brain went completely after many years. Um, perhaps a good example of what can go wrong. But one of the other ones that's been in, in the news very recently is whether you should ban heading in football, and particularly for young children or teenagers, because that may well be something that the repeated bang, 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 even though it's not a very severe bang, may be enough to be actually causing some damage that will accumulate and produce much more serious problems later on. So there are certainly some risk factors there. On the other hand, there are some things you can definitely do that are going to, at worst, delay dementia and at best might actually prevent it. And that includes learning a new skill, this idea of remaining intellectually stimulated, staying social, relationships being important, social life being important, keeping up with your hobbies, you have an interest, something that fires you, something that motivates you, that makes you want to do things, maintaining a daily routine, so actually having a, some sort of regular pattern to your life helps in that sense. Improving your sleep schedule, we've talked about. Staying active physically. Again, this connection between the physical body and the, the brain. If you look after your physical body, you're actually looking after your brain as well because everything is going to function that much better. Eating and drinking healthily. And if you are beginning to have problems, detecting them early and knowing where you can go for good advice. And that may be your GP, there may be other people that you can go to. Uh, because on the whole, if things are detected early, some steps can be taken that will tend to delay dementia. Now, but there's lots of medications beginning to appear, which they say have the prospect of, of stopping dementia or, or delaying dementia. But for some time, it's been quite true that if you detect dementia early enough, there are some medications that can slow it down. It doesn't stop it. I don't think MD's found the magic bullet yet, but it can slow it down. So actually recognising what's going on at an early stage and getting advice at that early stage is going to be quite helpful and productive. But the main thing I would say to you is enjoy your ageing brain. It's the only one you've got. Look after it well and it will look after you. Life is fun. It remains fun right through the whole extent of life from the young girl to the older woman. If you're looking after your brain, you will enjoy life more. You will get more out of life. And again, just a quick reminder here on this, this bit here about some of the things that are important, looking at your education, mental stimulus, looking at exercise, looking at rest, looking at your general health, what you need, etc. All these things are important.
and avoiding things like hypertension, so blood pressure problems, or avoiding stress. These are all the things that, that will help you to enjoy your aging brain. And that's where I'm going to stop. So thanks very much. Thank, thank you very much, Ray. Uh, are you up for taking some questions? Yes, certainly. Does anybody have any questions for Ray? Yes, Andrew. Are there any techniques for measuring your brain performance against your actual age? That's very difficult because, you know, one of the things I was saying there is that age is not necessarily the best criteria to use. And that's why all these age quotes all had the around uh, or about mark. Because people as individuals can vary quite a lot. That, uh, you know, that there is no absolute average which you could apply to everybody and say, you know, if you're 70, your brain should be like this. Because actually there'll be a huge area of variation. What you really are looking for is not that sort of comparison against age. What you're looking at is how well is it functioning? Uh, how well is it doing the things that you want it to do? Are you able to, to cope with day-to-day -day life? Are you able to enjoy the things that are happening around about you? And at the end of the day, that's actually much more important than a sort of artificial, are you good or bad for your age? It's, are you good or bad for you? Uh, and that may vary, and so some people will find that there's you know, an onset at an earlier age, some people will find that there's an onset at a later age, some people will find that there's not great evidence of a lot of onset at all because they survive quite well right into the very latest stage. And saying that one of these is normal and something else isn't normal isn't necessarily the most helpful way of looking at it. Yes, sorry. I'll take the guy at the back first, then I'll come to you. This is something I've heard about. The problem I've just heard now is that there's more um, potential permutations of connections in the brain than there are atoms in the universe. Well, I've already said, you know, the brain is an exceptionally complex system. You know, when we're talking about you know, even balancing out at 100 trillion nerve cells and all the various connections that take place. People have certainly said that, you know, that if you, if you start looking at the number of connections from the brain as it's fully connected, then it's a horrendous number. I don't know whether it's the same as all the matter in the universe or not, but it's certainly a hell of a complex situation. Uh, and, the, you know, there's the, the numbers involved. It's one of the things that makes the brain such a wonderful organ because, you know, that lump of flesh that I showed you at the beginning, you think, just look at that. Does it automatically tell you that this is an absolutely amazing organ that does amazing things right the way through your life? And it's not immediately obvious, but yeah, you're quite right. The, uh, the complexity of the brain is something that's very hard to, to really put a finger on. And when you start comparing it with things like you know how much matter or whatever there is in the universe, I'm not sure how helpful or what that is, but yeah, it is very complex. Uh, as shown in your slide, you said that the, uh, from 2 to 10, if you your, your have very positive uh, uh, input into the brain, and this, this child will develop very well after that, and uh, uh, vice versa. And uh, I, I think I have a, another example about the, uh, teenagers when they uh, are in their 14th, 14th, uh, 14 years old, they may have some very bad experience from school or from otherwise or get some damage. But they, they don't uh, uh, react uh, to these things, but they, they, will, they will have some mental illness uh, after 10 years old or, or have some very big problems uh, after, after a long time, uh, 10 years old or, or 15, yeah, it's, it's things like that. And, and I have another example about a woman, and, uh, about uh, they are 20, 20 years old, they, he, her head, uh, he, she was struck uh, to, uh, to uh, fainted fent, to the floor, and uh, she... Uh, Recovered two three days later, have no problem. But after uh, thirty years, uh, after she fled from this country to another country, that uh, have very severe severe uh, uh, pain of in the brain. And the doctor said, "Oh, you maybe you have a, a severe car accident uh, or something." Then then she remember, "Oh, that happens thirty years ago." So I think. Uh, so do you have any uh, 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 other information about the the this uh, any, anything due to the brain and then it will 
uh, have how many times at a long time, uh, how many times uh, regularly it will have an effect uh, in the future. Yeah, I mean, to start off with, I was saying that you know when the, the uh, child is very young, the brain is so active and so busy forming all kinds of things that that is an absolutely crucial period. And we saw how the peak of, of learning in a number of ways was during that early period. So anything that damages the brain at that time, and it needn't be physical damage, it can be changes in the way in which the brain makes associations with things, it can be changes in the way in which the brain perceives things, uh, and if that is set up in a bad way at that stage, then that can have consequences right through the life. They may not be immediately obvious in the child, because it's only when the child goes on to be an adolescent or an adult and is confronting different situations that these negative effects might become more obvious. And the other thing I said is, you know, that, that during the adolescent period, the brain is still very much developing and still very vulnerable. So negative things that happen during that particular period, again, can have quite a long-term negative effect. Sometimes you'll see that effect immediately, but sometimes, again, you'll only see that effect when it becomes important in relation to what that individual is doing at some later stage. There's also things like post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, which can actually produce changes in the way in which the brain is functioning as a result of very negative experiences, for example. That can happen at any age. There's been a lot of concern, for example, about veteran military people and post-traumatic stress disorder. But actually, post-traumatic stress disorder has begun to be seen as something that's rather more common than we thought. But again, you don't always see the effect immediately. When you talked about the person who appears to recover quite well, uh, seems to be functioning quite well, and then a bit down the line, something happens where it all goes haywire. Uh, and they're not coping that well, uh, and that's because the, the, the damage didn't have an immediate apparent effect, but the damage nonetheless was sitting there, waiting to have more effect later on. Uh, and also the general thing that I've been saying is that you, know, you really have to be looking after your brain through all its stages, because waiting until you're older and saying, oh, am I worried about the fact that my brain not, might, might not work as well now, Part of that will have been determined by what you were doing to your brain when you were 30, 40, 50. Uh, and again, you may not have noticed it particularly at that stage because the brain was generally functioning quite well. So it's like any system. If you weaken it, then there may come a point in the future where that weakness becomes important. Sometimes it will be important immediately. Sometimes not. Uh, and predicting exactly when it's going to be important, well, that's well being impossible because it depends on what's happening in that individual's life. But it's why we have to be thinking about brain health all the way along, because even though something, well, I mean, it's like what I say about heading footballs, and I've been heading footballs for years, think so what? And it's only now people are saying, hang on a minute, maybe heading football when you were 15 didn't seem to do much damage then, or even as an adult. But once you get to the older age group, the brain, brain's decaying faster because there was some inherent damage there that's now beginning to become important because of the other changes that are taking place. So it's a continuity in that sense. There are certain very critical periods. So the early childhood period is very critical in terms of the experiences the brain has. The adolescent period is pretty important in that sense. But basically, all of it's important. Some bits just a bit more important than others. Yeah, I think the brain is very special. It, 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 will, it is a salt to, to another person, and uh, we have uh, the, the, we have to reimburse this uh, person who are attacked. But uh, if it is uh, an other body parts, uh, we can uh, we can uh, evaluate the influence. But uh, if it is a salt to the brain, then it will be very difficult to uh, to uh, consider. Yeah. Well, absolutely, because, you know, although we're making advances in looking at what's happening in the brain, and we've made huge advances in the last 20 or 30 years in terms of things like brain scans and so on, but it used to be that the only way of knowing what happened to the brain was when the person died and you opened their skull and you had to look at the dead brain. So, oh, look, that hasn't been working very well. Oh, look at this. this. This looked wrong. Until we actually got quite advanced in relatively recent times, Knowing what was actually happening in the brain and seeing things like some of the damage was very difficult. Even now, with all the technology we have, 
we're still not able to pin a lot of it down absolutely because we don't absolutely understand what the brain is doing all the time. So we can make some general guesses and we're getting better at that, but we don't have all the answers. Could I add a bit about PTSD because it is more common, as you say, than we ever thought, but it is very reversible. It's easy to put on a unique proper way of doing it, but it really does a lot of damage that people don't even recognize they've got. And even stuff from childhood will affect the military. And, um, you know, someone with a serious accident can walk away from it. Another person who had childhood bad experiences could not walk away from it, you know. It's, so PTSD is definitely reversible almost any age. I think I've got a bit of YouTube-itis as well from uh, absorbing wrong stuff. But next time we give you talk, will you include the effects of glucose? Because I'm having a, a thing about glucose deteriorating my body. Well, first of all, now, I know that PTSD has been one of your areas of expertise, so I'm not going to claim that I necessarily have better answers than you have. But, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. That then it comes back to what I was saying earlier on, uh, you know, particularly about, I was saying particularly about older adults, knowing when you need help and getting something done at an early stage. And the earlier you intervene with something, the more likely it is that you can either prevent some of the negative effects or diminish some of the negative effects. And that's certainly very true with PTSD. I mean, for a long time, the assumption was that people would go through bad experiences. Oh, just get on with it. You know, you'll be better. It'll be fine and not recognising the damage that potentially could be caused. Now, I'm old enough to remember people who were around just after the Second World War, including people like my father, who went through some horrendous experiences, and they were told, oh yeah, but you know, you're tough, you're a man, you'll get on with it okay, you'll survive, just, just, just get on with it. But there were some things he could never talk about. There were some things that clearly had an effect on him. That had an emotional effect on him, and these changes were all important, but just completely ignored. Uh, and the argument is, and I'm sure you're well aware of this, that in many cases where now people experience traumatic events, that PTSD effect is not taken into account. It's not recognised that this may have a much longer term effect because it changes the way in which the brain will respond to certain situations and think about certain situations. The glucose one, I'm not so sure about. I don't know much about that. But I know that certainly, as I mentioned, diet in a number of ways can have an effect in terms of brain function. Certainly too much glucose is a bad thing because it's linked to, to uh, various kinds of body malfunction, too much sugar, HbA1c measures of uh, blood, etc. Uh, you know, that can all cause problems in, in that sense. But I, I don't claim to be an expert in that. I, I, I'm not. The cure for PTSD used to be thought to be a bottle of whiskey by some people, but uh, that doesn't work. And you can retrieve stuff from being tiny. You know, even as an adult, you can remember the details of what you've forgotten in your PTSD. Not that that's essential, but I've many times got things back from childhood with an adult that just completely wiped it. Still having an effect. Yeah, I mean, I quite agree with that, but it's a much more complex area than sometimes recognised. Yeah. Why uh, why people can't remember stuff, usually can't remember stuff that happened before they were like four or five years old? Do we know why that, uh, why that's the case? Well, yes, we do. It's, it's often not quite so late as that, but what they often say is that uh, children are very unlikely to have any real memories before about the age of two. Uh, and if we were looking at the, the graph that I put up earlier on that was showing at what point children are beginning to develop the ability to think more abstractly about things and to deal with concepts and to develop these kinds of memories, we saw that that was peaking just about the age of two. So it's only from about that age on that a lot of these things are likely to be embedded in the memory. Now, that doesn't mean... It can't happen earlier than that. You know, I've said several times now, you can't have one way of looking at it that's going to be true for absolutely everybody. And oddly enough, in my own life, I certainly have a memory from uh, just before I was two when my sister was born. And I remember my sister coming back, being brought back from hospital. And uh, we were living in a tenement at the time. 
and my mother was coming back from hospital and being brought in a car and the next door neighbour was holding me up at the window to see the car arriving. And I remember that, uh, at least I think I remember that quite clearly. And that's one of the other interesting questions. You know, are these memories absolutely real or do you recreate them afterwards? But I think I remember that. And my sister is two years younger than me. So that must have happened just as I was around the two-year mark. But yeah, it's, it's got to do with the, the brain development. Before that, the brain's not actually developed the complexity to understand and record these kinds of memories in that kind of way. But usually from about the age of two onwards, some memories will begin to be embedded in the system. I've seen they're always retrievable if you need them. I've worked with adults that have got memories from two-year-olds, say, and asthma attack that they thought they were going to die with. And it was just a normal event in hospital, but they remember it in the exact detail, you know, given that you've gone to age two. But it, it's there. If you, if you need it, it's there. Sorry, back there. Thank you, Ray, for your very informative talk. And there are many things in what you have said that are interesting to me. But one particular thing which really caught my eye, and I would like to ask you, I wonder whether you have done any more research on this particular question, which is to do with your slide on the Scottish Sentencing Council. You know, this guidance on, on taking into consideration the cognitive immaturity of the offender or the convicted person in sentencing. Now, that's obviously important, but to me, the equally important thing is criminal responsibility. And I remember many years ago, uh, I was doing a bit of criminology, and I was reading, or you know, in one of the lectures, we were talking about criminal responsibility, and the lecturer said, in England, I can't remember whether it's the case with the whole of the UK, Criminal responsibility starts at the age of 10. So a young person of 10 can be prosecuted for murder, say, just for talking, say. I wonder whether you have done any more research looking into this particular question. Sentencing, yes, you mentioned that guidance. But is there any guidance in terms of cognitive immaturity vis-a-vis criminal responsibility? I mean, it's not my area of expertise, so I'd have to say I haven't done any research, but it's an interesting area because if you look across countries, across the world, the age of criminal responsibility or accountability varies quite considerably and sometimes gets very young indeed. Uh, and certainly in many cases, people have challenged that uh, and said, you know, is this actually realistic? If you're looking at a 10-year-old and saying, can you really hold that 10-year-old criminally accountable? Uh, you know, a number of people have said, no, you can't. I mean, it's not the same as, as somebody who's 30 years old doing the same thing. That, that They're doing it on a different basis. That they're doing it in a less developed way. They're doing it without the filters in place, etc. Therefore, you, you, you to call it criminal responsibility is difficult. And, you know, even uh, here, for example, if uh, a young person is being charged with a criminal offence, you're not allowed to publish their name if they're below 16, I think. I can't remember now. It's about that age. Because, again, you know, this idea that even though you may be pursuing them for a criminal offence uh, at age 16, you're still recognising that they may be vulnerable in some ways and therefore protecting them from the public reaction or protecting them from the way in which people might write uh, TikTok stories about them or whatever uh, you know, is appropriate. So it's a very grey area and it's certainly an area that's been argued about a lot uh, and the question of exactly where you consider that somebody has become genuinely accountable for, for their behaviours. That's not to say a 10-year-old doesn't know what's wrong because they may well know what's wrong and they may well know that they've done something they shouldn't have done. But is that the same thing as criminal responsibility in a 30-year-old adult? Well, I would say no, 
Uh, that's my opinion. I know that these opinions are certainly argued about quite extensively elsewhere. And I know that, as I say, across the world, very different decisions are taken about uh, how to judge that. But, you know, based on what I've been saying tonight, my argument would be it's not so much about saying criminal responsibility. It's saying how responsible and how accountable and do you take that into account in the judgment that you're making about that person? Have you come across any explicit guidance to, say, to the fiscals? Well, I mean, I came across this one by accident because somebody oh. pointed it out to me. It's not because it's my area of research. And I just found it quite fascinating yeah. because it bore out some of the ideas that I had. And I thought, gosh, you know, even the courts are taking this into account that people may not be fully adult, even as late as 30 years old. But as I say, it's not my area of expertise. I'm aware of some of the issues, but beyond that. I've got some absolutely fascinating talks. Thank you for sharing. You mentioned I apologize, it's rather an unscientific question, more kind of a, a query in terms of your experience and if you think there's any bearings to this. But one of the things I've noticed, not as a scientist, but just as somebody observing things, is that kind of in old age, there's sometimes two directions that people can kind of fill their time and some people choose to sort of retire and engage in a hobby. And obviously that fills up a lot of their time. You kind of no longer have to work. They say, well, I'm going to go do what I enjoy. And, and some people continue to pursue their job, maybe through love of it, but if we're being honest, this economy sometimes is more of a necessity. And one of the things that, I, that I've noticed, and I'm wondering if there's any signs of bearing this, or this is just confirmation bias on my part, is... Um, is, is one more beneficial than the other? Because what I seem to have observed is sometimes people working a job are not necessarily happier or more enthusiastic about it, but it seems, again, in a very outside way, it seems to prolong life. Sometimes people working in those environments, that kind of purpose of every day going, maybe I don't want to do this, but I have to go and do this. Whereas sometimes hobbies, I don't know, it, it might be a very silly question, it might have absolutely no... No, I mean, it's, it's quite a meaningful question, I mean, but part of the answer again is that there's no one answer that's true for everybody. That, you know, I retired at the age of 60, uh, yeah, I'd been working in the health service for 35 years, and it came to a point I thought, right, uh, I can retire at this age, particularly because I had mental health officer status and then I got a bigger pension. I thought, well, that's fine, I'm, I can go. I didn't stop doing things. Uh, I remained very active in the British Psychological Society, for example, and was the treasurer there and actually for seven years after I retired on the board of trustees. Uh, I've done lots of this. This is about the 10th talk that I've done for, <laughs> yeah. for Ragged University. And Ragged University is not the only place that I do talks for because selling psychology, as I've been doing a bit today, is still part of my hobby as well as it was ever my job. Uh, and I still enjoy doing that. And I'm involved recently in uh, providing advice to a firm that's developing online counselling services using some of my knowledge and expertise of what, what it's been like for 35 years working in this field. So, in a sense, you know, some of that has been continuing to do things that I did when I was working. Some of it's been continuing to do new things or take up different new opportunities. And that will be true for lots of people. Some people will say, yes, you know, even though I've stopped working, there are lots of things I can do that are really keeping me fully occupied, that really stimulate me, I enjoy doing it. That's great. Some people will say, I really enjoy my work so much, I don't want to retire. And you get some people, well, you see newspaper articles retiring at 101 because, you know, they eventually had to stop doing whatever it was they did for all these years. But so I really enjoyed it, you know. I've run, been running this shop for, you know, 70 years or whatever more. It's been really fun. And I'm really sorry now at 101 I have to stop. That's fine because it's enjoyable. The big problem is if people are doing things that they don't enjoy and that are stressful, as we've already said, stress is a bad thing. So if that's what you're doing and that's why you're doing it and you're getting nothing out of it other than the fact that you get a wage packet, but the, the actual feeling you come home with every day is, God, I wish I didn't have to do that. That's probably not going to be very helpful at all. So it's about 
not so much what you're doing, but the effect it's having on you. If it's having a positive effect, if it's having it keeping you engaged, if it's keeping you stimulated, if it's keeping you socialized, whether you're doing that at work or whether you're doing that with hobbies, either of these will be fine. If it's causing a lot of stress and anxiety and worry, that's going to be bad for you. Whether you're doing it simply sitting at home doing nothing, or whether you're working a job that you don't really want to do. So is that your question? It does. No, thank right. you for that. Thanks. The back there. Um, you mentioned that like teenagers' emotions can be like two to four times greater than adults, and that there's like a, a THP hormone. Um, is that considered as like puberty onset of like puberty stuff? And if so, how would they be hormone blockers or kind of like like things like that prevent or affect? I mean, to some extent, what I was saying is that you know, that's part of the way in which the brain is reacting. If what starts to happen and what does eventually begin to happen is that there's a filter process begins to occur, which allows them to recognise that perhaps they need to think about this emotion differently, they need to think about that experience differently and learn how to deal with it differently. And that's not something that's going to happen instantaneously. But one of the things that can certainly be very important about that is the amount of support that the adolescent actually gets. Uh, so having someone to talk to about how you're feeling it is actually quite important in that situation. I also mentioned that you know, adults sometimes are not very understanding of what the young person is going through because they're judging their reactions and their behavior as if they were already adults. And sometimes, you know, what the, the young person needs is actually an adult who's being less judgmental and listening more to what's actually going on and helping the, the younger person to look at that in a slightly different way and to deal with it in a slightly different way. Uh, and that's not always easy because, as I say, young people are very often much more driven by what their mates are doing than they are about going to seek helpful advice. But again, there's been quite a lot of evidence recently about uh, social community groups who've set up groups for young people who are in distress, often young people who may have been involved in things like minor antisocial activity or minor criminal activity, and saying, instead of making a judgment about it, you come along and talk to us about how you are. Some of these things actually come down to, to the experiences that they're having that are then the experiences that they're reacting against. Deprivation is a big one. So people from deprived backgrounds are very often much more reactive and much less likely to consider the options than somebody who's been well supported and well cared for in other kinds of ways. So, you know, adolescents are going to go through that stage no matter what. The question is, how are they going to deal with it and how might they be helped to deal with it in the most effective and positive way? And the adults certainly have a role in, in understanding that and then responding to it in a way that's more appropriate. Does anybody else have a, a question? Or, or, or eight? Let me hear you counting from one to ten in Chinese. Your son, sir, woo. That's up to five. I'm, hang on. I get stuck <laughs> after that. <laughs> I didn't learn, oh, actually it's quite interesting because talking about languages and the difficulty and the ease with which child learns languages, I did go back to try and learn some Chinese uh, and I uh, attended a couple of evening classes and I got on okay up to a point, although again I've forgotten a lot of it because I'm not using it, so use it or lose it. Um, but one of the interesting things is that Chinese is a tonal language. So when you say something in Chinese, there's four, is it four different tones in which you can say a particular word and depending on the tone that you use, it means something different. So I'd be sitting there in the evening class and the teacher would say, right, say this. And I would say it. He'd say, no, 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 say this. I'd say, that's what I just said. <laughs> I said, no, 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 you said. I said, yes. <laughs> and the thing was that my hearing is not good enough to actually hear the tonal differences. Now, that doesn't mean I couldn't be trained to do that eventually, but the upward curve of the effort required for new learning. If you're younger, and if you're learning that language as a child, 
learning the tonal differences is no problem at all. You can hear them quite clearly and you can understand them quite clearly, you know, the difference it makes. For somebody, me in my 70s, going along and trying to do that, A, my hearing is probably not as acute as it was. I'm not used to listening for these kinds of differences in things and trying to actually learn to hear them and understand them is a pretty uphill task. So I have to admit I copped out. <laughs> Fortunately, my wife's English is absolutely perfect. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ray. Uh